Today is Mrs. Prosser's birthday. This morning she's 93. Yet this and every day of her life is full of chores and plans, full of work and of friends. Nowadays, with antibiotics controlling most infectious diseases, the physician sees more and more of his elderly patients carrying their years with ease and with grace. Though Mrs. Prosser has diffuse arteriosclerosis and her roommate suffered hemiplegia, they prolong the steady rhythm of their active lives. And because they've kept active despite their infirmities, they're still up and about, still going places. At 93, her palate still seeks out new tastes. Her eyes find new sights. Her friends encompass all ages. So she keeps fit for life by living, by living to the fullest extent of her ability. Unfortunately, the principle of active therapy for elderly patients has not been universally established. By the thousands each day, the elderly are brought into hospitals or institutions. By the hundreds of thousands each year, they remain to fill the beds until they end their days in that uncomprehending state that today shadows the final years of an ever-increasing portion of our population. They're kept safe, they're treated kindly, and for so many patients, this safe, kindly treatment. Those trapped by infirmity can often be equally trapped by safe, kindly, passive treatment. For a number of years, the medical staff of this home for the aged has been attempting to build and preserve the functional ability of its residents through a program of active therapy. Mrs. Greer's medical record is... Yes, it's quite a list, and there's more. Yet at 91, Mrs. Greer can still laugh at the doctors. The joke is really on them. For they have found that in her case, as in most others, the mere listing of pathologic conditions is often a misleading guide to functional ability and should not become the deciding factor in selecting patients for active therapy. During her 10 years in the home, Mrs. Greer has been encouraged to live fully and actively. By doing so, she has improved greatly her chances of living still more years of useful life. There's been no passive treatment for Mr. Schuster. Kept active despite the need for double cataract operations, he maintains the skill he found in mastering two artificial legs at the age of 79. That was five years ago. Mr. Schuster says he's no racehorse, but he's still going places. Mrs. Klein is back at a rounding board again, though a stroke completely paralyzed her right side three years ago. This ability to sustain recovery is the true measure of success in old age rehabilitation. Knowing what can be accomplished with patients like these, the medical staff of the home evaluates the problems each new resident presents upon admission. This is Mrs. Helen Lewis, aged 80.
The chief complaint is left-sided paralysis following a cerebrovascular accident suffered six months ago. Contracture and deformity are far advanced. Her medical chart lists chronic diseases that might well discourage any physician. But her medical history also states that until the stroke six months ago, this now helpless incontinent patient lived, despite her infirmities, an active, self-sufficient life with a married daughter. This is medical information of the highest value, for it tells the physician that until the present illness interfered, Mrs. Lewis had good functional ability. That was six months ago. The neuromuscular examination of a severe hemiplegic includes a crucial functional test. Most hemiplegias who can lift the heel of the affected leg as little as one inch from the examining table should be able to walk again. The patient is now sent for an evaluation by the full professional staff. Chaired by the Director of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, the evaluation session begins with a discussion of all that is known about the patient. Reports from the social worker are indispensable, and often members of the patient's own family are asked to be present. What the physician may hear from Mrs. Lewis's daughter about her mother's past life and daily habits, what she may perhaps unwittingly reveal about her own attitudes and fears, may tell him quite as much about the case as the medical notes. At such times, feelings can run very deep. On a first examination, the patient's initial state of confusion often gives a discouraging impression of both mental and physical capacity. Mrs. Lewis is 80 years old. So the word that might come first to mind is senility. But to use so vague and indefinite a term, is as unhelpful as it is unscientific. The doctor looks first for the possible physical reasons for such emotional disturbances. Ideally, exercises are often begun within 48 hours after a stroke. Had Mrs. Lewis's rehabilitation been started then, she might have avoided such complications as disuse atrophy, contracture, and depression. Six precious months have already been lost. It's vital to begin the work of rehabilitation quickly, lest poor mental and muscular patterns become fixed beyond hope of correction. Often the patient has a completely erroneous impression of both the nature and extent of the illness and resents any suggestion that she could do more for herself. Mrs. Lewis is incontinent. This is a functional symptom that should be reversible in the majority of cases. Yet, Mrs. Lewis has remained incontinent since suffering a stroke. Her family finds this loss of control more disturbing than anything else. The patient, too, is ashamed. One should not attempt to draw definite conclusions about any patient's capacity for rehabilitation on an initial appraisal. A much more accurate picture can be gained by comparing these first observations with those made after a few weeks of therapy.
Results of these simple power and range of motion tests, however, can suggest what practical goals can be given the patient for the immediate future. Now we can ask Mrs. Lewis, would you like to be able to go to the bathroom by yourself? She certainly would. It would be wonderful. The patient's ability to regain self-sufficiency in toilet is the most important turning point, mental as well as physical, in old age rehabilitation. Thus the physician has begun to use one of the basic human motivations to support Mrs. Lewis in a long, hard fight for independence. Mrs. Lewis has made a beginning. She has found hope. The physical therapist often starts the program of rehabilitation at the patient's bedside. First, Mrs. Lewis has shown how to shift the weight of her still almost powerless left leg with the right. Once a patient can do this, she can usually be taught to sit on the edge of the bed by herself. And with this skill mastered, she's well on her way to bridging the gap between bed and chair. This takes time, it takes training, and it takes patience on everyone's part. But once Mrs. Lewis can control her wheelchair, the whole pattern of her life can be changed, and she can avoid what is perhaps the greatest enemy of health in old age, unnecessarily prolonged bed rest. After a few more weeks of training, Mrs. Lewis should be able to go to the toilet by herself. Then she will be a great deal easier to care for a great deal easier to live with. The continued incontinence of adults is a hard thing to bear with, however professional one's attitude, or however sympathetic one might be with their plight. In three weeks, Mrs. Lewis's linen requirements have been reduced from 18 sheets a day to an average of four. The patient's efforts to get out of bed, the mental lift as well as the physical exertion they brought, have been a major factor in decreasing her incontinence. Though Mrs. Lewis still has her bad days as well as her good, she knows that she's making progress. Victims of the more severe cerebrovascular accidents, those suffering aphasia, for example, often need help to accept realistic goals without becoming discouraged. The few words Mr. Holtz has mastered are a real achievement for him. Yet his progress can be blocked if the meagerness of these gains is allowed to let him lose heart. A cheerful, relaxed atmosphere for therapy should be maintained. When the patient can be prepared for exercises with light massage, radiant heat or whirlpool, spirit as well as muscle is relaxed. Feels good. But there is no improvement in muscle tone or function unless active exercises follow. Movements designed to keep the arms pliable, even when loss of their function appears total, helps prevent shoulder stiffening, and often makes it easier for the patient to bathe and dress. Mrs. Lewis is still learning to use her wheelchair. Its brake and pedal routine needs to be absorbed so thoroughly that these movements finally become automatic. Once they are, she will find in the modern wheelchair a freedom comparable in many instances to that of crutch walking. Use of the chair keeps her whole body active. She feels better, more like doing those exercises designed to help limbs directly affected by the stroke. Many of these patients need to regain their sense of balance. This slow, steady pace is more fruitful 
than early spectacular attempts at walking that too often lead to falls. Though independent walking is something Mr. Holtz will probably never know again, he lives in a place that's been adapted for wheelchair use. Door sills have been removed. Toilet doors widened. A stand around the toilet bowl itself is fixed solidly enough for him to use it as a support. Now we begin to see the results of those long months of training. Mr. Holtz has kept his affected arm pliable with pulley exercises, so it's now free enough from spasticity, pain and contracture to pull his suspenders over it. The wheelchair brake and pedal routine is now automatic with him, so he can stand from his chair in safety. He maintains his balance using leg, trunk and arm muscles that have been strengthened by exercise sessions between parallel bars. The importance of this kind of independence to an elderly patient's well-being, mental as well as physical, can hardly be overestimated. Mrs. Farber wants to be too independent. As with many strong-willed elderly patients, the fact that she simply can't do many things for herself anymore is the hardest burden her old shoulders must support. Such people are often difficult to care for. Might be a good deal easier just to keep them in bed. But keeping any patient unnecessarily bedbound, whatever their age or infirmity, can only be described as an act of medical neglect. Active therapy is good medicine even for patients who require a great deal of continuous nursing care. For Mr. Hubert, a victim of rheumatoid arthritis, this trip from wheelchair to bed will always be a struggle. But just the fact that a patient can make that trip on his own several times a day can reduce the amount of nursing care required by a half. Mr. Hubert has spent months as a bedfast patient. He knows this freedom is worth the struggle. For Mrs. Brenner, age 95, the world has shrunk almost to bed size. But letting her help to feed and wash herself is important. By such small means, elderly invalids often can be prevented from sinking into the final vegetative state. Physical medicine is no panacea. Its work with victims of Parkinsonism, like Miss Proctor, for example, is in its beginning stages. In all probability, substantial relief from this and other chronic illnesses will come from other branches of medicine. Yet even here, the basic principle of rehabilitation can be applied with profit. By promoting movement, one helps to preserve the ability to move. It's sometimes easy to underestimate what patients can do for themselves. Hard to remember the importance of pride. Even in such extremities, the patient's pride is often a major support. Miss Proctor has not lost her pride. Mrs. Jessup is recovering from a long bout with pyelonephritis. Though antibiotics usually see patients safely through dangerous infections, adequate care must go further. A few weeks' confinement in bed for a patient of Mrs. Jessup's advanced years can lead to the loss of a great part of her functional ability.
Reconditioning should be commenced as soon as the patient is permitted movement. It's a good plan to combine these exercises with bathing, dressing, or going to the toilet. For the goal is to help her to regain the ability to do these things for herself. For most elderly patients, it's seldom feasible to schedule exercise sessions punctually on the hour. This tends to discourage both the patients and those responsible for seeing that they come. Just getting here on their own is often a struggle, a useful one, but a period of rest may be required before work is begun. Therapy conducted on an individual basis is a necessity for those who have suffered strokes, fractures, or other serious disabilities. Yet, many of the benefits of group therapy can be maintained when a number of patients take their individual exercises in the same room. Unfortunately, many patients are brought to therapy only after deformities have become so rigid that no amount of treatment can bring substantial improvement. And by this stage, the patient may well reject any attempt at therapy, any intrusion into her placid life. Many sick old people, when they're brought for the first time to the physical medicine department, look upon all its activity and paraphernalia with suspicion. Seeing a distorted face can send a shiver of fear through his heart. Feeling himself surrounded by so many who share his infirmities, but whose stares reflect none of the accustomed sympathy for his troubles, he may shrink even further into himself. But when graduates of the department return for a visit, everyone gets a lift. Often these former patients became friends while occupying the next wheelchair in this very room. Oh, the gossip can be wonderful to hear. see progress around them, even the skeptical tend to develop a respect for the program, a respect bordering on faith. And even the most independent need such faith to sustain them through the long months of effort that lie ahead. Each new patient is given a realistic appraisal of what he can expect to accomplish here. Mr. Rossman knows he's hypertensive and has had three cerebrovascular accidents. Yet, gently, with cautious moderation, his faith in the program is encouraged. Faith is a vital ingredient in any program of rehabilitation. To sustain it, the faith of all those who work with him must be equally strong. Once a professional violinist, Mr. Rossman is both afraid and ashamed. Ashamed of these hands he can no longer control. Afraid he will lose even more of their use, despite all the doctors may be able to do for him. In such cases, the assistance of a psychiatrist may be indicated. Indeed, active physical programs often become a part of psychiatric treatment. Mrs. Gabriel, aged 88, has broken her hip. 
an intertrochanteric fracture of the right femur with broad spectrum antibiotic therapy to prevent post-operative infection an internal fixation was carried out successfully. Old bones heal slowly and require adequate protein in the diet with vitamin mineral supplements. They also need the anabolic effects of androgen estrogen therapy. Fractures are of course the most common accidents suffered by elderly people, particularly women, whose loss of calcium after the menopause is severe. During the long months often required for complete union, prolonged inactivity, particularly bed rest, must be avoided. Often she needs a considerable amount of encouragement to keep active. But if she's been prepared for this from the day of her surgery, she can generally be persuaded to cooperate. Slow, yes, but just, just give her time. She'll make it. A loose felt boot is a useful device for helping elderly patients remember not to put weight on the affected limb. As soon as the patient can sit in a wheelchair, more active exercises are begun. Strengthened by these exercises, the patient can push herself up to standing position between parallel bars. Here it's easier to exercise the affected limb without weight bearing, easier and safer. Elevated on a wooden block for clearance and in the safety of the parallel bars, most elderly patients feel at ease and can maintain a good range of motion. Today, Mrs. Gabriel will be permitted to walk for the first time. She's been following a graduated weight-bearing program, and serial x-rays now indicate sufficient union. Because Mrs. Gabriel has been kept active, the affected limb kept supple from the day of the nailing, this 88-year-old woman is beginning to walk independently again, 12 weeks after she broke her hip. Training has begun early enough and continued long enough to prevent faulty gait patterns, most elderly victims of hip fractures can walk normally once more. Mrs. Wise is hypertensive and had several coronary episodes before she broke her hip, so operative repair was not considered advisable. This mentally alert patient faithfully performed active exercises while in traction. And today, at the age of 81, Mrs. Wise is graduating from her cane. Mrs. Lois is making progress too. As the body ages, it does lose muscle tone, takes longer to accommodate itself to braces, and to learn the new coordinations these require. Yet the ability of most elderly people to build new muscle and learn new skills is far less limited than is commonly believed.
to support the flagging spirit, to keep hope alive even when the simplest skills seem lost forever. This is the courtship of therapy. Each morning she asks, coming up for exercises? Mr. Holtz thinks not, doesn't feel like it. Most patients like to come to the physical medicine department. These sessions offer them a welcome break in the long days often made longer by pain. People learn to loosen up, have fun together, even make jokes about the very infirmities that have brought them to this place. Some few, like Mrs. Farber, simply prefer to keep to themselves to keep their everlasting war with infirmity a fierce personal battle. Mrs. Farber has osteoarthritis of the lumbar spine in both knees. Generalized osteoporosis, arteriosclerosis of the aorta and vessels of the legs, and an ununited fracture of the left hip. Yet, she walks. Once their anger, their drive, can be properly channeled, it's in these difficult or stubborn personalities that one often finds most hope for rehabilitation. She knew he'd come. Mr. Holtz just doesn't want to be bossed. In his fight to go on, these daily arguments with the therapist seem to help out. Mrs. Farber forces herself to exercise daily. Two trips up and back with a rest in between are about all she can manage. Yet by such means, she avoids that bedfast, vegetative state that almost certainly would be her fate. We can never forget that for the vast majority of elderly invalids, this is the alternative to aggressive, active therapy. patients need to see that the therapy they receive will help them do something that's important to them in their daily lives. Those fare best who can go back to work, even part-time, or can find an active hobby that really interests them. When the family unit survives, daily chores can often serve well enough. The old dependencies, even the old irritations they share, can be important stimulants. And pride, Pride in one's own room, pride in one's appearance. Such humble things become major weapons in the patient's constant fight against physical and mental deterioration. There's achievement for Mr. Holtz when he can believe that the rug he learns to weave trains his finger so he can dress himself. There's achievement for Mrs. Black when she can feel those painful stretching exercises help her to comb her hair. There's achievement of a sort even for little Miss Proctor, the victim of Parkinsonism, when she can know her efforts push back the day when other hands must feed her.
one can expect frustrations. Indeed, the experienced therapist learns to anticipate them. Tomorrow she knows she will need some other approach to keep Mr. Rossman at work. Those who work with aged patients must be realists. Yet, they can never discount the power of the human spirit. Few patients with Mrs. Lewis's capacity for recovery will need long-term institutional care for medical reasons. Once programs of active therapy are available in every community hospital and through private physicians. The six months of passive treatment she received following a stroke almost made her a chronic invalid. Almost. Yet today, Mrs. Lewis is able to go home. At 81 years of age, she can graduate from the home for the aged. fight with infirmity is far from over. Yet looking back, recalling the bedfast, incontinent patient of one year ago, who can call it less than a triumph? One day, most of us, each in his time, as a fracture, a stroke, some disability of aging befalls us, will understand better how Mrs. Helen Lewis feels on this day. Of the millions of elderly people around us, now all but cut off from home, from friends, from work, by debility, many could benefit greatly from some program of active therapy. When they can, many more will be able to live on in fullness. Mm -hmm.